And I thought I would then simply share with you my adventures in science and literacy. Because that would be unique storytelling, things that just simply happened to me. And so we'd be comparing notes in our walks through life. And I'm not unmindful that I alone stand between you and my, what you do for dinner. And so I will try to keep this moving, okay? Now often, I have a slide here that I, I learned from Joe Nickel. I think he might be in the room. Uh, Joe Nickel, great ghost hunter uh, there ever was. Private investigator turned paranormal re researcher, investigator. And he did this once, so I just had to do it. I've been doing it ever since I saw him. So I'm, this next was first done by Joe Nickel. As I said, often, Talks such as this are loosely veiled commercials for a book the person wants to sell you. <laughs> this talk is no exception. <laughs> Give it up for Joe Nicolai. Actually, I don't like doing book talks because you just read the book. If I'm here live, I should tell you things you can't otherwise find any place uh, at any other time, and that's what's going to happen today. First of all, actually, I got to get. Let's get, just get this out of the way. Uh, Pluto. Uh, I, I had something to do with with it. So, get over it. All right, so there you go. Uh, Pluto was, was named by an 11-year-old girl in England who had just learned her mythology, her Roman mythology. It could have never been named by anyone in America. They could have never come up with the name Pluto. Because in the 1920s, leading up to the 1930s discovery, even though an American discovered Pluto, over that time, there was a widely advertised mineral laxative called Pluto water. <laughs> Relief of constipation. The tagline there was, when nature won't, Pluto will. <laughs> so whatever Americans were thinking about naming the new cosmic object, Pluto was surely not it. So the reason we demoted it, because there's, there's thousands of other objects out there that look more like Pluto, that either Pluto or they look like any other planet in the solar system. We found a new category of object out there, the Kuiper belt of icy bodies, of which Pluto reigns supreme, as well, reigns large as one of its most significant members. So I think Pluto's happier there. Um, <laughs> it's among brethren. And so, so get over it. And so these are the new dwarf planets, these are round objects that are too small to have cleared their orbit of other debris. And Earth is shown there in relative scale. And so there you have it, a new class called dwarf, uh, dwarf planets. Pluto joins that class. A new place, the Kuiper Belt. And here's a letter from a kid. I got hate mail, but I'm going to show you one of these. <laughs> there it is. Dear scientist. Dear scientist, <laughs> what do you call Pluto if it's not a planet anymore? If you make it a planet again, then all the science books will be right. <laughs> Do people live on Pluto? If there are people who live there, then they won't exist. <laughs> Why can't Pluto be a planet? If it's small, it doesn't mean it has to. It doesn't have to be a planet anymore. Some people like Pluto. If it doesn't exist, then they won't have a favorite planet. <laughs> Please write back, but not in cursor because I can't read it. became a video, uh, we made it into a, a, a PBS Nova special, and it was the early days of my Twitter stream, and I was learning what people say or think when they learn something, and this was one of the more colorful tweets 
I've ever received. <laughs> I'm going to read it in the back row. Okay, I just got done watching the Nova special, The Pluto Files. It was freaking pink. <laughs> I did a, a, a Nova segment featured here in Las Vegas, included an interview with uh, Penn and Teller, in fact. And at the time, I sent out a couple of tweets while I was here in Vegas, and I just thought I'd share them with you, because they're relevant, actually. I landed at the airport, and I did the vain thing that all good authors do, they look, you look for your own book in the bookstore. <laughs> so here is my tweet. Borders Books at Vegas Airport does not have a science section. <laughs> Wouldn't want to promote critical thinking before you gamble. <laughs> then on my way out of Vegas, leaving Vegas today, a city conceived and designed to exploit failures of logic in the human mind. <laughs> It's not going to hit seven again, it just hit seven two moves ago. <laughs> In fact, why don't we send a tweet now? Right away. Do you think I can get back into there? Let's see. Uh, does that work? Hang on. Almost there. Uh, yes. Like that. Okay, you can't see that, right? Right. Okay. Well, now you see that. Yeah. Good. Okay. So there's there's sort of the Twitter. Let's put one up there. I already had one. I live in Vegas. Thank you very much. Our human mind, forged and wired for decision making on the Serengeti, is drawn to Las Vegas <laughs> and is helpless there. <laughs> See if that'll go. There it is. Okay, I just got sent. Who's the good part? How about that one? <laughs> the American Physical Society held a conference here. These are the world, the nation's physicists. They're all branches of the field. They decided to have a, a meeting in, in, in Vegas. Why not? It's a convention town. That was a newspaper headline. Subsequently, the Las Vegas asked the American Physical Society to never return to the state. <laughs> 